What does the Sorting Hat tell us about trans identities? Hello and welcome to Fox Yorkshire Reviews. If you're new to the channel, a very, very warm welcome. We cover everything trans from news, reviews and trans related topics. And for people coming back, thank you very much for returning. It's really appreciated. I thought it'd be really interesting to cover a bit of Potter fandom over the Christmas periods. I am an Arnia fan and have been for many years. <coughs> But they haven't produced any movies or any TV series much recently. And I don't think any more can be made, unfortunately. I must admit the TV series is especially special in a number of ways. And it's very dear to my heart. But what I have found is, obviously, with the Potter movies, they're making more. Of course, you have Fantastic Beasts as well as, of course, the original set of movies. And I think the Harry Potter series has got a lot more depth than some people give it credit for sometimes. And does delve into some quite interesting topics. But one of the things I want to focus on here, as I've been kind of reading up on some of the background behind Harry Potter is the sorting hat and of course the big thing is you put the sorting hat on and then it will put you into a house. What I find interesting with this if you follow the Potter fandom the hat actually has a conversation with you so yes it will look at your personality and what is the best fit but ultimately the person can guide the hat into another direction. I think it's quite interesting that the fact that those labels may not be as fixed as people may perceive them to be and there's also been a few videos that have described some individuals as unsortable i.e maybe they have traits from Ravenclaw and Slytherin or maybe Gryffindor and Slytherin or even Slytherin and Hufflepuff is a possibility. I think it's kind of interesting here because obviously different houses have different drives so I would say for Gryffindor that would be coverage or bravery obviously for Ravenclaw that's a source of knowledge and for Slytherin I wouldn't describe them as evil I would describe them as ambitious. And Fufflepuff, I'd be more well-rounded, nurturing, considerate. But quite a lot of individuals I can think of which would be sorted, potentially be sorted, into a number of different houses. I think it creates a very interesting question. When you're sorted into that house, you stay in that house for the time you're at Hogwarts, where I could argue a lot of things can change and you develop over the years. With the sorting hat, then, placing prominence on what you value as a person and of course that can change but I think for a lot of people they are now obviously a number of years after those initial books were coming out are questioning whether you would have one core drive or a number of core drives and whether people would be unsortable as in they would have both these things competing at the same time and then that's not a bad thing. And I think that's really interesting to have those discussions because when you're talking about especially gender, gender identity, gender expression, you have male and you have female, and those are both very established concepts. And of course, those go with a lot of social constructions. But when I meet people and talk to them, it's quite clear I can see elements of both what society may consider as male and female in them. And obviously that will then affect the way that I might talk to them, I may approach them. I don't value male behaviour better over female or vice versa. I just see them as who they are and how they present to each other. And I think this, I think, ties into a lot of things here. Because obviously once you join a house, you can't leave to go to another house. And if you have a relationship with another house, that's also frowned upon. And I think there's lots of parallels there. There's definitely some men that I've met in my life that I identify as a straight male, but they have a more woman or feminine side to them. But because I don't conform to this very narrow male perspective, you'll see that sometimes those particular traits in them will be diminished or will be criticised because they don't fit a certain mould. And this is what I think is really interesting, the Harry Potter community, these unsortable topics have been discussed quite freely and easily. I think that's actually really useful here because the more that I look at these social stereotypes around male and female, what we may even consider to be a gay man or to be a lesbian woman or to be a bisexual woman or so on and so forth. I think a lot of people do look at these stereotypes and even now will make comments and judgments based upon them. And I think it's even more important than ever that we can just be open about these topics. And I think those should be celebrated in that diversity in and out of the LGBT plus community base. And I really hope that going forwards that we can have more open discussions with society around expression. And so we can be more accepting of all the wonderful individuals we have within it. And I really hope we can move away from some of these stigmas and some of these social constructions. Because I don't see them as very helpful or very beneficial to anybody. And I don't think they really serve any decent purpose. And quite a lot of times they're built on 
a lot of fallacies. And I really hope that because going forward people have that freedom of expression rather than that overbearing sense of social pressure. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I really do appreciate it. As always, you've got the Twitter, the Instagram and the email if you do want to get in contact and if you do have any ideas. And as always, thank you very much for watching and please subscribe. Thank <laughs> you.